Hometown Scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax Lost Cities of Grays Harbor Hello there. How well do you know this place in which you relive? If you've been around for a good number of years, you probably have about as good an idea of Grays Harbor as most people. But I wonder if you really know this old place. Suppose someone said, Meet me at the corner of Broadway in the town of South Harbor. Would that slow you up? Or could you jump into the family jalopy and drive straight to South Arbor and walk down Broadway as casually as you could and wait for your friend to show up? No, it's not a joke. There is such a place. Broadway, the Broadway of South Arbor, is 100 feet wide. One of the two widest streets in the town. Main Street is also 100 feet. And it was once a great dream that didn't come true. You know, we've talked about boom towns on our program, and we found among the pages of our scrapbook the stories of such famous towns as Acosta and Grays Harbor City. But we've passed right by some of the other towns, of which were many, each a dream of a metropolis, greatness, that never quite materialized. And when Dick has said a few words from our sponsor, We'll tell you about some of these cities that haven't germinated yet, although they're as much as 60 years old and even older. And strangely enough, many people have never heard of them, much less walked down their, their broadways and main streets. So Dick, while you take the customary few seconds, we'll open the scrapbook to the page called Lost Towns and Cities and find tonight's story. The years of the 1880s were bad years in the Middle West, and they were boom years in the Pacific Northwest. California had dominated the development on the coast through the mid-years of the 19th century. But with the movement of the lumber industry from Michigan and Minnesota into the Douglas fir regions of the rainforest, the Pacific Northwest began to go, and then the new country, with its promise of timberland riches, attracted the Midwesterners in droves. Land promoters with maps of new cities worked their way through Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, and the Dakotas, selling paper lots to prospective immigrants. And the lot and building numbers, the new deeds with its official seal, became something for the unhappy Midwesterner to cling to, and sort of a key to new happiness. But when he arrived with his family in tow, ready to settle down on a lot that was described as in the heart of the city or lapped by the waters of the Blue Pacific, the chances were pretty good that he found he had bought a piece of hillside where a mountain goat couldn't make a home or he wouldn't see his lot until the tide went out because he'd acquire a chunk of tide flat. No, all of the early day promoters weren't like that, but Grays Harbor had its share of them, and a good-sized crop of opportunities moved in from outside. That was how South Arbor happened to become a paper city. It was December 1889 that a group of Walla Walla men got together and organized a company called the South Harbor Land and Improvement Company, and on the 26th day of March, 1890, Secretary Roland Smith of the firm noted in his book that R.E. Brown had appointed general manager with full power to sell, transfer, and dispose of their lands of the company and to file in the county, the auditor's office of Chehalis County, a plat of the company's lands with appropriate dedications to streets, alleys, and public lands. So, on April 10, 1890, D.R. Jones, the auditor of the county. They then called Chehalis, recorded the plat of the town called South Arbor. 
It was located just half mile north and east of a little village of Markham, at the mouth of John's River, and on paper it was an elegant town, one that would vie aggressively with such paper-born cities as Acosta and Grace Harbor City. All streets were 80 feet in width, except Broadway and Main Street, which spread to 100 feet. Alleys were 15 feet wide, and the standard lots were 25 feet by 130 feet, and 50 by 150 feet. That was South Arbor, and its promoters fanned out over the west with blue-printed plats of the new city and began to dispose of their lots wherever they could get a hearing. It was apparent, they said glibly, that South Arbor had a great destiny. It would someday be the Back Bay District of Grays Harbor. Every new town had to grow to be something in its, er in its area. Grays Harbor City was to be the, Dul the Duluth of the Pacific and Aberdeen the Minneapolis of the West. Cosmopolis was to be the World City and Tacoma was to be the City of Destiny and the name that it still clings to. But South Arbor never ever blossomed, as did Grace Harbor City in Acosta. It became a clearing on the banks of the harbor. The lines were run and stakes driven for streets, but no hotels rose there, no saloons, no livery, such as those that had mushroomed in other towns. It was just a paper city that was forgotten as the boom and bust, and the alder trees took over and the hemlocks followed, and except for the complete maps of the harbor that guide the abstractors in their work of cataloging the property of the county, South Arbor is almost a forgotten city entirely. But for that matter, we recall the city of Grays Harbor. Oh, there was such a place. And on maps, there is still a city of Grays Harbor. Now, don't confuse this with Grays Harbor City. That was on the north bank of the harbor. The city of Grays Harbor is on the south side and is located not far from South Arbor, perhaps a half a mile upriver. We ask you to note that one was the city of Grays Harbor and the other is Grays Harbor City. This is the distinction that the public made in two town backs, back to back in the 1890s, for actually both towns were platted as city of Grace Harbor. The city of Grace Harbor that is still shown with the name on the old maps, however, is the one that we want to talk about, the one on the south side near Markham. For its founding dates back before the city of Aberdeen, it was in 1883 that its promoters filed a plat in Montesano showing the, con the confines of this new town and went out to sell their lots to Midwesterners and more than one weary traveler who thought that he had come to the end of his long journey went down the river on a boat to Westport and had his lot pointed out to him from the deck of the steamer, a lot that was still covered with timber and that stood wild and unfrequented in the midst of the wilderness. When you next drive down to Westport, you will pass near the city of Grace Harbor just to the right of the big hill, this side of Markham. The alders and hemlocks grow thick on the streets of this dream city. There were the towns of Peterson, down on the peninsula near Westport. It was filed in Montesano on May 23, 1884, by Glenn Peterson, acting for his son Frank. The Petersons did not promote their city with wildcat ventures, but rather waited for the growing harbor to catch up with it, envisioned a town growing amongst the dunes, catering to tourists, studded with fine hotels with shops and markets catering to the carriage trade that summoned the town of Peterson. But the daddy of them all in the town that today passes with the name of Wanucci, it was on March 13, 1871, that, that I.L. Scammon and his wife, Lorinda, laid out the town in Section 18 of Township 17 on the south bank of the Chehalis. The blocks were 200 feet square and the street 60 feet wide. 
Fur Street skirted the edge of the river and D Street started the march of alphabetical streets running downstream. The town was Grays Harbor's first county seat and might be the county seat today had not some progressive citizen who built a competing town of Montesano across the river a few years later stolen or kidnapped, if you prefer, the county records from the original town and moved the courthouse by vigilant methods to its own town of Montesano. And then, as the original town of Montesano faded and people called the new town by its rightful name, the old town became Wanucci. If it can be called a town, for there is no longer evidence of a street, and it never boasted or built in the way of buildings or civic improvements. And today, it's all but forgotten except for a musty record in the county courthouse in the town that stole its name. The records note that the plat was acknowledged by Edward Campbell, Justice of the Peace of Chehalis County, Washington Territory, May 13, 1871. Oh, there are many more, and they span the years of settlers having been called Grays Harbor Home, all the way from I. L. Scammon's town that traces back to 1871, and the Carter Peterson town of Chehalis at the mouth of the harbor, which goes back even farther, up to such relatively modern town sites as Grass Creek on the north side of the harbor that was platted in 1909 and never got beyond the paper stage, nor is it clear why anyone wanted to plot a town there, except there was a sawmill whacking its way through the swamp timber from the backlands, and I suppose promoters have quick eyes for such opportunities. If you run over the real estate maps of Grays Harbor, you'll find a lot of ammunition for thought. There's the town of Iron Springs. For, for here... We hear of that. It was born July 20th, 1908, just north of Capellas Beach, where Max Hardman and John F. Reed, acting for their cor corporations, dedicated the plot. There were Seattle men, but their project got no further than one sponsored by Portland men or Tacoma men or men from Walla Walla. And like Roosevelt Beach, Tunnel City, Otter, Polandville, Fuller, Ocean Grove, the dream of growth and development that were to turn lines on papers into streets with buildings never materialized. Not ghost towns, for many of them never became towns at all. Just lost cities out of Grays Harbor's colorful past. And now, here's a few words from Dick Crombie and our sponsors. Yes, Grays Harbor's map is a record of shattered dreams and also, and unfortunately for those of those who build, call home. A record of great many dreams that have come true and some that have not. Like the map of almost any portion of this car-worn world, the story of people who had built in towns and who had lived and died, worked and played, loved and fought over its soil, this story is for their reading on cold factual data things platted on maps from long ago times. It takes a lot of reading between the lines to find the stories of the heartbroken investors who bought paper real estate to find that it was worthless, ruined speculators who sunk the wad of cash into dream cities that never came true, the bubble or bust times of the past. But they are there, immersed in the skin of the stories of the lost cities of Grays Harbor which we find tonight as a page in our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening.